All right. So I'm Shervin, and I'm going to be talking about um, what I call decision region determination for touch-based localization. So first of all, what do I mean by touch-based localization? Why is it useful? A while ago, we were tasked with uh, doing some kind of task of fine manipulation, like grasping this drill in such a way that we can turn it on. And what we found is if you use the general pipeline of sensing it and just trying to plan to a, a location to grasp it, it, it never worked. So what we came up with is doing the sequence of what's called guarded moves, where essentially you move until you make contact with the object, and then you can execute this in sequence in order to reduce the uncertainty and enable you to accomplish the task. And this took this task where we were basically failing every time and made it extremely robust. Similarly here with the microwave, uh, what we're going to do is try to push one of the small buttons, and we found a sequence of guarded moves in order to accomplish the task. The problem, though, is that these sequences of guarded moves had to be hand-coded for each object and for each task. So some programmer sat down, iterated a bunch of times, and came up with a sequence that by the end enabled us to accomplish the task. So the goal of this project was to automate this, this problem and to come up with a sequence automatically. So let's take the task of pushing this big button on the microwave and trying to open it and come up with a model of, of how to represent this uncertainty and how we're going to diminish it. So we're going to represent our uncertainty with a large set of hypotheses, where each of which is a location of the object. And then if you take this guarded move, you have these tests where you can gather information. And if you were to execute the guarded move, it would make contact. You could update your distribution. If you executed the guarded move and you happen to stop at a different location, you would end up with a different set of hypotheses. Okay. So I'm going to show you the end result of the algorithm and what that looks like. So we have our uncertainty that we got. Maybe we uh, use some sensor to see where the microwave is. And then we generate a bunch of hypotheses. And what we did is we select an action from a large corpus of guarded moves that we sampled. We're going to execute it, update our distribution. Based on this new distribution, we're going to select a different action, execute that, um, basically move forward until we make contact, update our distribution, and repeat this process. So what we've come up with is essentially a policy that takes in a set of hypotheses and the previous tests that you performed and the observations you received, and you kind of you continuously execute this until the algorithm is happy enough with the remaining hypotheses, and then it goes and it pushes the button, enabling it to open the microwave. So start off with uncertainty, reduce it, and then you can accomplish your task. So a little more concrete about what's happening here and, and sort of how we take the set of hypotheses and how we think about it in the algorithm. So you imagine that you have a bunch of dots, a bunch of particles, sort of, where each of which corresponds to one location of the object. And you take your whole set of hypotheses, and that's a bunch of dots in some space. So that's the uncertainty distribution, essentially. Then we take our guarded moves, and we think about, OK, well, if you were to take your set of hypotheses and put your hand in a location and execute it, and you move forward, and then you got some observation, well, there's only some hypotheses that agree with that. And so if you go back to your dots, some subset that's going to agree with that observation, that guarded move. And if you were to execute the same guarded move and get a different observation, you might have a different set of hypotheses. So overall, a test is basically going to take your set of hypotheses and sort of partition your space, where a subset corresponds to different observations, right? So each of those partitions is a different observation for this one test. So our initial approach to this problem said, OK, well, you have a set of hypotheses. You have your tests, which essentially prune your hypotheses away. And our goal should be that we should just determine the object location completely, and we'd like to use a SU test. And a bunch of people have approached this problem. And a while ago, we published some work that did this. And all was great. We felt really great. Everyone was happy. Until we revisited the problem a little bit, and we said, something's kind of weird here. And we're not taking into account the task that you're trying to perform. And as a matter of fact, we're probably doing unnecessary work in that you don't need to fully localize the object. You really just need enough information so that you can accomplish your task. So we went back to our model and we said, OK, well, how do we formulate this? So if we're going to push the button, eventually we're going to have to take the robot hand and put it in a particular location and move forward in order to, to try to push the button. And so for each of our hypotheses, you can, kind of, you can simulate this forward. And you can decide whether or not it would succeed for that one decision, right? Um, you can take another hypothesis. You try to push it forward. If it doesn't succeed, you note that. And so if you take your overall set of hypotheses, you can forward simulate for all of them. And you decide whether or not it would succeed for this particular decision. 
and so you can simulate it forward, and you can label essentially the subset of hypotheses that for that location of putting your hand would succeed for that task. And I'm going to call that a decision action being the, the particular place you're going to put your hand and move forward, and the corresponding set of hypotheses I call the decision region. Okay? And you can, you of course, you generate many decision regions, so you have many sets of things you can do to try to accomplish your tasks. So original framework that had hypotheses and tests with the goal of determining the object location gets modified a little, where now we have also these different decisions that we can take, and our goal is no longer to localize the object completely, but it's just to determine a particular decision, a particular place that you can put your finger and move forward that's going to enable us to succeed. And uh, as before, we'd like to do this with the fewest tests possible. So we call this the decision region determination problem, where the problem basically boils down to pruning your hypotheses until they're all within one of your decision regions. So we have this framework, and we need to, um, sorry. So initial idea was let's just run our old algorithm, and let's just terminate when we're in one decision region. So basically, not think about the decision regions, but only terminate. Uh, when we'll succeed. So if you think about how that's going to work, you can formulate these sets of hypotheses and tests where in terms of number of hypotheses, they look equivalent. But if I were to add the decision regions, it's kind of obvious. So here you can see that in this test is going to guarantee that after you execute this test, regardless of which of the observations you receive, you'll be able to execute your decision. Whereas in this test, um, while you prune just as many hypotheses away, it's essentially not giving you information in terms of which of the decisions is going to be better. Um, to kind of give you an analogy, a lot of similar problems that people have worked on, s they use Shannon entropy in order to gather information. <coughs> and some people use something called value of information, which is also taking into account the task at hand. And it's often been shown that value of information works better. And in fact, for touch-based localization in particular, uh, other formulations have, have shown that using value of information helps you um, and performs outperforms using just Shannon entropy. So we're going to tie in that same idea into our framework and see what we can say about it. So overall, if you think about the framework, we, have, uh, we start with a set of hypotheses, and we can sample a bunch. And these are each object pose locations. We also sample a set of decisions and simulate those. And we label for each hypothesis which of the decisions it would succeed. And at this point, we have a large set of tests, each of which kind of partition our space in some way. And if you were to perform that test and receive an observation, you'd keep one of the partitions of that test. And this is a big tree that kind of goes downward. Uh, it's basically a POMDP where we've imposed some additional structure in that we, we are imposing structure in both the tests and the regions. And so we're simplifying the problem. And our goal is to find a policy for this sort of additional structure that we've imposed. So the question is, can we sort of solve this POMDP-like problem with this particular structure we've imposed? And the answer is yes. And we'll go through the algorithm of how we come up with this. But I, I want to mention that at this point, we sort of abstracted away the touch-based localization problem. We've turned it sort of into these discrete actions and decisions and hypotheses. And really, any problem where you can formulate these three things, you can put into this framework. So other things that we've actually applied it to is bird conservation and movie recommendation, things like that. So really, anything where you can formulate your uncertainty as hypotheses, you have some information gathering tests and decisions which you might make at the end, you can put into this framework. Uh, a quick bit about the difficulty of solving this problem. Um, so basically what we're trying to minimize at every point in time is the expected number of tests for your policy that it's going to need to compute in order to solve the problem. It's both NP-hard to optimize, and it's actually NP-hard to approximate better than logarithmically. Uh, but, I mean, it's no coincidence that we chose this particular discretization. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, the reason we did this is because what we're going to do is we're going to rely on a set of analysis tools and algorithms that have been developed for these sorts of discrete problems. And in particular, what we're going to do is come up with an algorithm, which is what's called adaptive somodular the details of which I'm not going to go into. But it's this property that if you can show that your problem has this property, you can get a bound of this form, okay? Where a greedy algorithm, which only needs to look one step ahead, is actually logarithmically close to the sort of the optimal thing, which is actually looking at the whole tree and solving it. And I want to point out that the form of the best bound that you can get with any 
non with any exponential algorithm, sorry, with any uh, polynomial time algorithm, is similar to kind of what we get with the super simple greedy algorithm that's very fast to compute. Um, and we'll go through kind of this alpha and where that comes later. Okay, so going back to our original problem, we have these tests, uh, sorry, we have these hypotheses and these decision regions, and they're often overlapping in that for a particular hypothesis, you would think that there's multiple decisions you can execute that would work for that hypothesis. Uh, so what we found is that there's a known algorithm, actually, that exists that for disjoint regions would work. So, uh, and we're going to end up extending that algorithm, so I'm going to go through that. It's, it's pretty simple. It's called equivalence class edge cutting, or EC2. Apologize for the reference to the Amazon EC2. It's not the same thing. Uh, EC2. And what we're going to do is we're going to take each hypothesis in different regions, and we're going to draw an edge between hypotheses that don't share a region. And an edge is cut if any hypothesis it connects to ends up being removed by the algorithm. So what I mean by that, I mean if you perform this test and you get an observation that's going to remove that hypothesis, you remove all the edges that were connected to that hypothesis. Okay? Um, and this is going to have a few key properties that's going to make it useful to us. The first of which is all edges are cut if and only if any hypothesis is in one decision region. That is, if this problem is solved, this problem is solved if and only if all edges are cut. What that's going to give us is kind of a natural metric that we're going to use to try to solve this problem. That's just going to be to maximize the number of edges we cut in expectation. So we select tests to maximize edge cutting. Second, it has this adaptive modularity property enabling us to make the guarantee and use a greedy algorithm that works well. So we're going to go back and we're going to take this algorithm and we're basically going to extend it in order to work for our problem of these overlapping decision regions. So how do we do that? Uh, the algorithm we're going to come up with is called direct. So we're going to take this, this set of overlapping decision regions, and what we're going to do is going to generate a separate EC2 instance, set up in such a way so that one is kind of the inside region and everything else is the outside region. And we're going to draw all our edges in those regions. And now, if we pr perform a test in our original problem, and that eliminates some hypotheses, we go to all these EC2 instances, and we eliminate the same hypotheses and all the edges in each of those instances, okay? And this is set up in such a way that all the hypotheses in run region, if and only if, in any one of these instances, all the edges are cut. We good? So this is just a, a purely the way we set it up. We have this one inside. We've basically made it so each problem is saying that, will this one decision succeed or not? And now our task, our, our idea is, OK, well, can we take all these instances and sort of combine them together? And in particular, what we like to do is combine them in such a way that preserves this adaptive some modularity property. So what we're going to do is we're going to find one objective that, that essentially sort of ors all of these things, which is the solution that we end up coming up with, saying that if, if any of these, is in, if this is EC2 instance is solved, or this one, or this one, uh, it works. And the way we do that is what's called the noisy or formulation. Um, and just real quick, if you imagine this fi being the number of edges that have been cut normalized to one, sorry, the number of edges remaining normalized to one, this sort of product goes to zero if any of these numbers goes to zero. So if any of those problems goes to zero, the whole objective goes to zero, and this total thing goes to one. So we want to drive that to the maximum. And the only way to do that is for any of those single instances to go to zero. Um, and it turns out that that does preserve adaptive some modularity for this, for EC2 uh, specifically. It's not a general property that if you apply this to any adaptive some modular function, it preserves it, but it does in this case. Okay, so that's, that's great. So at this point, we have an algorithm we could run, uh, but the problem being, there's one problem with it, which is that our performance and our computation time is sort of dependent on the number of regions now. And we'd like to eliminate that, and it turns out we can do a, a speed up to make that faster and to work better. And what we're going to do is, as opposed to needing a separate EC2 instance for each region specifically, all we need to do is to ensure that <coughs> none of the EC2 instances have any overlapping regions, because EC2 works for disjoint regions, any set of disjoint regions. And we can borrow another idea from these discrete computer science literature, and that's graph coloring, where we define a vertex for each of these regions. We connect them if the regions are overlapping. There's any hypothesis that's in both of those regions. And we run a graph coloring algorithm 
And what we can do is basically generate an EC2 instance for each color in that graph. Okay? So red is at the top here, these are the yellows, and these are the greens. And at this point, we can do the same. Yep. We can do the same thing where we draw our edges. And if you perform a test and get a particular observation, we can cut all the edges in the corresponding EC2 instances, and we still have the same property that if and only if one EC2 instance is solved, uh, our original problem, everything is in one region while preserving adaptive moduli. So a quick bit on results. So on the top here are some theoretic results. Uh, I told you, I described the direct algorithm just now. So k here is the number of colors of our graph. And essentially, we match the, the bound. It's logarithmic uh, compared to the exponential. Sorry, compared to the optimal algorithm. Um, and our runtime is going to be the number of colors times the number of hypotheses. Each EC2 instance is n time. Uh, we have another algorithm that I didn't go over that ends up having a better bound, but a slower algorithm. And, and to compare in simulation some results, the so GBS is kind of our old algorithm, which is agnostic to decision regions. That's up here. So this is query complexity, the number of tests required. In order to solve your problem, this is the number of tests available to the algorithm. We forced the regions to be disjoint. We ran EC2 and compared against that. Here, what we did is we ran the same algorithms, those algorithms to select tests, but we stopped with our new criteria, which is everything in one decision region. Um, value of information, as I sort of described before, is not agnostic to tests, but it doesn't have this ad adaptive semodularity guarantee. And our algorithms are down here, which both have the adaptive semodularity, enabling greedy to be good, and also are taking into account decision regions. So backing up a little bit, we tried to sort of simulate these sequences. And we so we have one win, which is we're adaptive, compared to these sequences, which are sort of fixed by the programmer beforehand. But actually, if you, if you look at it, you can tell that there's some things that we're missing. The biggest one being that our motions are sort of global. We have this big set. We're selecting them. We're not taking into account the relative cost. And this is the thing we're working on next. Um, and our tests are also simpler. And at this point, uh, I'm out of time. And I'll take questions from Mr. Rivers. Thank you. Right, so, so if you look at uh, these results, EC2, the way we computed this here, is we took the uh, region, so we generate a bunch of decisions, we sample, we simulate, and then I basically force them to be disjoint by just assigning it to one of the regions. Um, and that's, that does perform worse than if we let them be overlapping. Yeah. Uh, it's, so here's the number of actions that you end up using that it's required to get it in one decision region. So it took more actions. Um, on average, maybe one and a half actions more. Right. Okay. Uh, great talk, by the way. Um, Thank you. So it looks like you're considering like hypothesis sets that are all discrete. I'm wondering if there's any kind of, con like if you had, say, a continuous Gaussian distribution over code or something. Is there something that could be done? Um, yeah, I mean, the reason we did that is because kind of we wanted it to be general, to be, so you could just plug in kind of any model of an object and generate these samples. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's an interesting line to kind of do something in between, I would say, where you have fewer samples where each one has some amount of uncertainty. But we haven't addressed that problem. Yeah, I don't know. One last question? Great, yes, thanks. Thank you.